good morning good afternoon good evening thank you for joining me wherever you are joining me from i'm shubhanjan and our session today is about why revenue is more important than funding for startups uh, topic close to my heart i'm a serial entrepreneur i know how we are all uh, looking at funding uh, and we believe that funding is the holy grail of success uh, but uh, it's anything but so tldr of today's session which will last about 20 25 minutes funding cannot guarantee success but revenue can of course you need to define success and we'll go into some of it uh, as we go along but to me if you can build a 5 million dollar arr business in a 5 7 year period where you are making 2 million dollars profit with 15 employees and uh, uh, three co-founders i think it's a very very good uh, return on time and an effort a bit about me i'm the founder of pitchlink the buyer seller engagement platform uh, we enable buyers and sellers to have more conversations and that leads to more conversions uh, i'm also a podcast host i have three running podcasts right now Uh, the first is bits about books it's in its 22nd uh, episode uh, i talk to internationally known authors i have had guests uh, like uh, rand fishkin uh, founder of moz cash nickerson uh, and and so many more uh, and i'll be quoting rand today because he is uh, one of my favorites uh, one of the few founders who has raised a lot of money has been celebrated has done breakthrough work and has some very very interesting and very important views uh, the second uh, podcast i do is called the buyer side chat i believe that in the selling buying landscape the discourse is disproportionately uh, sort of weighing in favor of the sales side of the discourse yet the buying and selling is a two sided process uh, very little is spoken about uh, the buyer side and in the buyer side chat i talk to actual buyers of large companies of smbs and so on and actually talk to them about how they decide on buying so it it could be a one person uh, organization or a very large organization where there may be 20 people involved in a buying decision uh, the third one is called saas stories uh, this is about talking to saas founders and co-founders and and people involved and try to learn what is working for them and what's not i also wrote a book called what i learned today uh, this is uh, uh, a compilation of uh, 500 daily posts that i did starting 1st of january 2019 in linkedin uh, this is a uh, selected uh, post uh, book which is a compilation and i also have three us patents for technologies i developed for a multilingual visual training platform which i built just before i built uh, pitchlink that's me tell me a bit about you so i will not take any questions while i'm doing this session but uh, i will pause from time to time ask you some questions and it will be great if you put in your answers in the chat uh, and i will circle back to them uh, if, if if we have time enough and we will talk about those uh so so right now please tell me uh, what is your role are you a founder co-founder are you in a startup are you working for a startup and so on uh, what's your startup solving what's the problem that uh, you are focused on what is it that is keeping you up at night and are you focused on raising capital if if it is if it is correct then write f so i'll know you're raising capital uh, f for funding or revenue so if if you are a startup which is focused on revenue that how do we make our quote unquote prospective customers uh, pay us then write r and and we'll come back to that in a bit and it, and it's open so once you write people will be able to see so some quick st stats right 90% of startups will fail i mean there can be various reasons we'll not go into those this discussion is not about whether startups fail or not we are going to basically talk about funding and revenue uh, but this is this is the fact 
business loans credit cards lines of credit account they account for three fourth of financing of new firms it's a very important number to remember because all this disproportionate amount of talk about uh, venture capital funding and the numbers that get thrown about that 100 billion dollars was invested so on and so forth it only accounts for 25% of all capital that's funding business so it's really not that big but the attention it gets is disproportionately uh, more pretty much like how sales gets disproportionately more uh, more attention than the buying process building up startup is is very very hard it is not something you can start and you can flip and you can make money and get out that rarely works if if at all so if you are going to get acquired it's at least a seven year uh, journey if you want to go for ipo typical median is 11 years so from start to 11 years before you get an ipo and thereby you obviously make money the 10 person which succeeds if you're not part of that and if you're not likely to succeed big and fast your investors are not going to stand by you so never have this idea that i have raised 1 million dollar they will have a stake in the ground and they are going to support me if i need that's not going to happen that doesn't happen and i'll i'll quote rand he has some very interesting points to make uh, i'll i'll come to him uh, quickly and and uh, quote him from his book lost and founder and same book uh, rand writes that you are more likely to get rich in a job than by starting a business so if your sole objective is to be rich you may not want to start a startup the key takeaways today are these always talk to your customers first before you do anything um, i know that a lot of times we are encouraged to have an elevator pitch uh, you know we like to go to fancy networking events corner a, a, a known vc and give him a pitch hundreds of people do that that's very exciting um, it sort of feels as if you are doing something uh, but that rarely helps uh, but if you spend that time going out and talking to customers or prospective customers your ideal customer profile and talk to them and show them your idea or some mock ups uh, and take their feedback that's likely to be far more useful than than trying to talk to vcs remember revenue is the key to success so the faster you can get to revenue the better so there is this interesting uh, concept uh, called uh, software as a service right so uh, anderson wrote famously that software is eating the world uh, and 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 saas is now eating the software saas stands for software as a service so there is a flip side to it and i'm talking to it uh, talking about it in, in connection with revenue many a times softwares evolve from specific needs that we have which means i am doing a bunch of things and i find it tedious i'm using too many apps pretty much how pitchling came about and i can talk about that later uh, and you feel that this can be simplified this is this is too messy this is too cumbersome and so on and you start building a product think about it in a flip side uh, or rather flip the idea and say what if we call saas a service as a software so whatever is your idea go out and talk to customers who are having the same pain using too many things to do one thing and say hey what if i could automate that at the back end and do this for you will you pay me something i'll give you this service i'll i'll help you rationalize all your data your user data and and i'm going to sort of create a generate a spreadsheet every week which you can give to your uh, sales folks to follow up and i'll update everything manually all the data that comes in all the conversations they have i'm going to do that and and will you will you pay me and if you see that you get 10 15 20 people who become oh yes if somebody can do it my god we can save so much time please do it 
we'll, we'll pay you like $500 a week or whatever. And you suddenly have 10 people paying you $2,000 a month. You know that this can become a product. And, and then you start automating the obvious parts and start pushing them out. And, and then eventually build your product. So going the service route, which means you are immediately into revenue, is a great way to test out the validity of your idea and whether you can actually have people paying for the product eventually. And as I started off with, uh, and I'll continue with the last point first, funding is overrated. So quickly we'll define what's a startup. I know this is like, you guys know all this, but I thought just to set context, it'll be nice. So uh, Neil uh, Blumenthal, co-founder of uh, Warby Parker, he says, a startup is a company working to solve a problem where the solution is not obvious and success is not guaranteed. So that's his take on what a startup is. Uh, Paul Graham, founder of YC, uh, Y Combinator, one of the most well-known uh, incubators, accelerators, whatever you call it. Uh, many, many, many large, successful unicorns and come out Airbnb, Dropbox, you name them. A uh, lot of them owe their success to his approach. And I, I, I totally dig uh, the kind of advice he talks about. Um, he says that what really separates out a startup from other kind of businesses is that they can grow. They grow fast. So their focus is growth, uh, which obviously sort of connects back to the funding and, and, and similar ideas. Uh, but that's another take, uh, not necessarily that I, I completely agree with it. Growth, uh, what is growth? Is 20% per annum enough? Or all of us have to look at like, uh, triple, triple, double, double, double. We'll come back to that. That's the unicorn making formula. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that. But these are like two takes on what a startup is. But let's start with the elephant in the room. Funding is overrated. And, and I will quote now couple of points that Rand Fishkin writes in his book, uh, Lost and Founder, what VCs should but don't tell you. You can read them. The, the, the first point is that, hey, you are just one of the 10, 20, 30 companies I'm going to invest my money in because I have to place a lot of bets because I need a 100x return. If you are one of the companies which is going to do well, I will be all over you. But if you're not, you are not likely to get me my time or anybody's time for that matter from our side. If you would be happiest building a strong, stable business that's profitable, that makes you wealthy and happy, that has reasonable harmony between your work and the rest of your life, you are absolutely the wrong choice. So if you're going to, really slog it out, like three years, do nothing, eat, dream, sleep, the startup, and you drive everybody nuts in your team to achieve some, you know, unthinkable level of growth and traction, then you're a great, great fit. So the truth about funding, funding is, funding does not guarantee success. Otherwise, 90% failure won't have been there. Nine out of 10 funded businesses will fail. So obviously funding doesn't uh, guarantee success. Even if the company succeeds, you may not be able to take any money home. The reason is, hypothetically, you are building a company, you have raised $10 million. After three years, somebody gives you uh, an offer to buy, buy you out for $200 million the VC might say, no, we'll not sell because they have those rights. When they give you the money, they have all rights to veto everything. And because you may be one of those, one of the 10 
which is likely to get them the return, they will say, hey, wait for three more years and we can make five X more. You would have been perfectly happy taking a 10 X return at this point in time or 20 X return, but they want a hundred X return and they will not let you go. So the, the, the point is, there is no guarantee that even if you're successful, you will make money and take the money home because so many clauses in the legal documents will be overriding it. Again, remember in today's day and age, a lot of startups are non-physical software kind of startups, SaaS startups dominate. Most of those kind of startups don't need money. I mean, today you can get cloud services for your hosting, you can get softwares, uh, your you know, open source codes, uh, you know, hiring talent from anywhere in the world where it is cheaper and so on. You, you do not need to raise a lot of money uh, in most product classes. And there is no denying the fact that once you have $5 million, it's very easy to decide that we'll throw a launch party and spend $100,000 because you think, you know, you know we, we, we want attention. We have raised money. We have, we have done something. And, and, uh, and, and don't forget that it takes time to raise money. If you, if you have to raise money from VCs, you need to spend typically six to eight months full time you know, doing papers, lining up things, meeting people. And it is not at all uh, unnatural to imagine that you will meet 100 VCs before the first check is written. It's possible. And even if you're doing like two, three meetings a day, it might be three, four months before somebody is willing. Now, after he's willing, there'll be due diligence, there'll be clauses, there will be, you know, n number of things. Why do we prefer to put efforts in convincing VCs rather than customers? Customers come with no strings attached. Customers actually validate. Anyway, we'll get there. So raising money is always not very good because you might end up spending a lot of money which are unnecessary or are premature. You'll go out and hire a VC of sales when you have not actually yourself sold, uh, say, 10 customers or to 20 customers. How will you know what the VP is, uh, VP of sales is saying is, is right or the perspective is correct? Venture capital was originally called risk capital. Venture capital has its use. Make no mistake. In a very high risk scenario, I mean, you are trying to invent a new kind of fuel you are trying to invent a new kind of treatment to a disease, uh, which needs a lot of money upfront. I mean, to create a vaccine, it will take years and it will be another five years before you get the FDA approval or the respective country approvals, and then it gets into manufacturing, then it goes into the hands of the end user. It's a long haul. So if you have some great ideas like those, Venture capital is great and it's risk capital because even after you have developed something, you may not get the necessary approvals and so on. It may hit some roadblocks, which is not at all feasible for somebody to see. So it's possible. And in that scenario, the venture capital is uh, looking for a 10x, 20x, 100x return. It makes sense. But not when you're building a calendar which sinks five other people's calendar. Doesn't make sense. Make no mistake that the venture capital model is excellent for venture capitalists. They are always standing. They will benefit. Even their LPs may not benefit, which will only impact their next fund. But they will always benefit. Third thing you remember, is media plays a willing role in hyping funding as they are also beneficiaries. Media had a dubious role during the first dot-com boom, which saw millions of people lose their 401k. You know, there are lots of great stories about analysts coming and hyping this uh, uh, share and that share and all of that. 
Uh, and that, that was a strange time because people could go public in six to eight months without any revenue whatsoever and so on. But the point is the media played a dubious role at that point of time. Even now, there is a deep connection why funding is celebrated. Funded companies are the ones that will sponsor events and spend on advertising. So media benefits. So do not look at the glorification of funding. Uh, a friend of mine was telling me that if I go to LinkedIn and I say, this year, I did a quarter million dollars of revenue, I'll get five likes. If I go and say, I raised a million dollar of VC funding, I'll get 160 likes. Go figure. Quick question for you. Can you be a unicorn? Do you think your idea can potentially be a unicorn? Which means from today in the next five years, can you get to $100 million revenue? And if you apply the triple, triple, double, double, double formula, you need to do about $3 million, $3 to $4 million this year. So triple next year, $12 million, triple again, $36 million, double 72, 144. That's how it is, right? So, so you need to have a revenue today, the ability to triple, triple, double, double, double over the next five years, get to 100 million at the end of it, which also means that you're also, you should be addressing a market, a total uh, addressable market of three to $5 billion. You cannot take away $100 million otherwise. Uh, there is another formula which uh, Thomas Tungus uh, uh, wrote, uh, Nine Point Capital, um, great company. Uh, if you're not following him, do follow him. Uh, his idea was, if you can find one person dissatisfied customers of Salesforce and see why they're dissatisfied, one person of Salesforce customers, and build that, you will build a unicorn because Salesforce's value is about $100 billion. You find a niche where they're not doing very well, not paying attention. They have uh, dissatisfied customers. That's another way. But that's the kind of size you need to be to be attractive for funding. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. So please let me know in the chat. I'm keeping a track. We'll come back to this. So make no mistake, talking to customers first is the key. And there is data. According to CB Insight study of 106 startups that failed, the top reasons are related to not connecting with the customers. Number one reason startups fail is because of misreading the market or not speaking with customers enough. And these are the other reasons, user unfriendly product. What does it mean? You're not talking to users. Ignoring customers, 14% of the startups that failed actually ignored customers. Think about that. So why should you talk to customers? Steve Blank in his uh, class outlined this. You need to test your hypothesis. So you need to talk to partners, people who have access to your customers. And you need to talk to prospects and customers. Customers as in who are your potential, whom you have sort of built a profile of that. This is the kind of people who will be using my product. So for example, for PitchLink, our target customers are salespeople who are trying to get a meeting to take their conversation forward. The biggest challenge in sales today is not getting the face-to-face -face meeting because buyers are not willing to meet anymore. So if I'm starting off with pitching, my job would be to go and talk to sales folks and figure out, hey, are you having trouble talking to your customers? How exactly do you sell? How many meetings do you have to have? How many people do you need to meet? How do you share your documents, your data, your ideas with them? Do they keep track of them? Do you know how they keep track of them? So on and so forth. When you meet the partners or the customers or prospects, the idea is to answer these three questions. Who is the customer? Sometimes you may go and find out 
that the person you thought is your customer is not your customer at all. It's somebody else. You made a picture in your head that this is the kind of people who are likely to buy from me, but maybe a adjacent department is much more focused on that problem than those that you thought are. What is the problem that you're solving? You may be thinking that I'm solving a problem of not getting face-to-face -face meetings, but what you're really solving is consolidating the conversation. And what are the potential solutions, which also gives you a clear idea as to how you are better than those, or what needs to go into your product so that it becomes, uh, you know, resonates with your with your customers. Revenue is the key to success. Quick questions again. How many of you are pre-revenue? So if you are pre-revenue, please write PR in the chat. Do you know what is your churn rate? So churn rate means every month, how many of your customers are not continuing, not going into the next month? So you can do it monthly, quarterly, or annually. Uh, the best way to grow your company is to have a negative churn rate of about 1.4%. Uh, if you follow my uh, posts on LinkedIn, uh, I have written about these extensively. There are many, uh, many people who have written about this. Uh, one of my bits about books uh, podcast uh, was with Carl Gold, the chief data scientist of Zora, and he just wrote a book on churn. So if you want to understand churn, go and read that book. Uh, so what is your churn rate? What is your CAC LTV ratio, cost of acquisition of customer and lifetime value? Do you have a number? Do you have a number? You, th these, are, these are important questions. If you can share some of those, I'll have a sense of how, how it is working for you. So to carry on, Going for revenue does what? It validates your idea. Even if 10 people are willing to pay you today, and so I'll connect back to the idea of service as a software. So if you don't have the product, never mind. Go and see if you can sell that as a service to, to, to customers. Uh, like getting appointments, is a big problem. There is no doubt about that because already there are numerous services available who help you set up those meetings. And millions of dollars are spent on that service. So we knew very well that getting a face-to-face -face is a challenge. So when you go after revenue, the first thing that happens is that it validates your idea, which is, which is very critical, right? It also forces decisions because you'll be, you'll be hearing things and it will tell you that you need to stop this and do that and so on. It is not something you are sitting in your uh, you know, own thought castle and building up something because you fancy it, because you think that's a great idea and so on and so forth. It proves that customers value your product or service or not. This is a, there is a very high possibility. So what are you really doing? You are building either a PowerPoint mock-up or if you are if you're a coder yourself, you code some basic stuff, which is not real coding. It's like hard-coded, click this, this will show up, click that, that will show up and so on, which gives a sense of the flow of the product or the service. And you take it to 100 prospective customers and you get feedback and they say, hey, this is not a problem at all. I mean. We, we are not going to spend any money for this because we have that and there is that. And, and we have this thing, uh, which is already taking care of it. And I don't think we are going to separately spend money on that. So, so it gives you a validation or otherwise, or inputs to tweak it, pivot, whatever you call it, identify a better problem 
a more burning problem, which people will be more willing to pay for and so on. If you go after revenue, the moment you go and ask somebody, hey, use my product for free. Uh, can you give me some inputs? They'll be very happy to give you inputs. You ask them, will you pay $10 a month and use this and see what happens? You know what I mean. It extends the runway. It's extremely critical. It's, it's not important to have the perfect product. What is important is to have enough people paying you enough money that you can continue to tweak it and develop it and, and take it forward. If you can have the runway, even if you don't have a product market, it takes three years for a proper product market fit. So even if you take those three years to get to a product market fit, which will now let you go into that triple, triple, double, double, double mode, you need three years, those three years, you do not need to raise money, uh, take on responsibility, sign off your company, but you go after revenue and you will know that, yes, although I'm doing this in a small deal or I'm having only 50 customers paying me, but it's enough because I can manage with four people and I can continue to pay them. I can continue to pay myself. I can continue to work and get towards a product market fit. And obviously, it lowers dependence on external parts. So how do we do that? How do we get revenue? We have to understand the buyer. Very simple. You talk to someone to understand that person, relate with them to get insights, uh, and also to validate the hypothesis, as I quoted Steve Blank. So what do you do? You ensure that you can measure the value your customer is getting from your product and help them realize that. Because most of the time, products are abstract value. I mean, it saves working time. It saves time for your SDRs. It saves ABC. How do you quantify it so that the buyer in his head can make the math and more importantly, can go and actually convince other colleagues that, hey, this actually saves me time. I am paying $6.72 for Slack every month because it saves me looking at multiple things from my colleagues and we are all in the same Slack group and we have separate rooms where multiple people are talking in separate threads we never have to go and look for anywhere. That itself pays back 10 times that $6 I'm paying. That you need to articulate, you need to find out, and you need to communicate that to the buyer. You need to understand how the customer is framing your solution or framing the problem, and you communicate the value in those terms. You don't invent new, invent new terms. You, you talk in the language of the customer. And in this process, as you are continuing the conversation, as the customers are talking to you, remember that you have to constantly build trust and earn trust. And it is not a one-time job. You need to continue to earn it as you go forward, as you go forward. A person trusts you, then two of the colleagues trust you, then the organization trusts you with a particular assignment and then some more. So this is an ongoing process. You, you violate it once and it's gone. It's gone faster than it came. And besides addressing the specific pain that you are building for, remember that the buyer has changed. Lot of the sales discourse that we have out there is outdated. Buyers are not the same buyer anymore. Most of the advice out there are outdated. There's a lot of data showing that. We are still selling to the buyer persona from the 80s. The new buyer empowered by the internet and access to data is playing by new rules. He's extremely concerned about privacy, about permission. You will not be able to get crash and have a meeting. If a customer is not willing to meet you, he's not going to meet you. Buyers today want zero interruption. 
And why? Because the information asymmetry, which actually made the salesperson very valuable is gone. The buyer has a lot more information today. And over, over that, the buyer today knows, and it, he always knew that this is my need, which you don't know, which we as the salespeople don't know. Buyer not only has all the information we have, buyer also has information about my competitors. And buyer has the most critical information that this is the need. For me, I still need to go and discover. So remember these three major shifts that has changed the buyer completely and put the buyer in control of the buying selling process. Finally, remember no company was bought based on how much capital they raised. Oh, you raised $5 billion. Okay, let's value at $30 billion. It doesn't happen that way. The valuation is always out of your revenue and profit. Whether it's acquisition or IPO, your valuation will be based on your revenue and multiples of revenue. To profit, or to get rich, be profitable. The only way to ensure that your startup succeeds is to be a profitable company. And that happens only with customers' money. That is revenue. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, let's see how much time we have left. And I will try to circle back and, and look at some of the data that you have shared with me and we can continue to chat uh, and, and interact with each other. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I hope uh, it was useful. Uh, if you have any thoughts, uh, reach out to me. Uh, I'm available here. Uh, you can also tweet to me at hello Shubhanjan. Um, if you want this pitch deck, tweet to me. I'll send you uh, this pitch deck. Uh, if, if you want. Okay, let's get along with, uh, with the interaction. Thank you very much.